Um, okay, without further delay, I'm extremely honored to introduce uh, a person who needs no introduction, actually, a true legend whose posts and projects inspired me personally and probably many of you uh, to work on performance. Rika Mariani. Okay, good morning, and thank you for having me here today. Uh, we're going to talk about how to do badass performance work, um, and this is going to be a fun little topic. Um, when, when, when they asked me, and, and first of all, I'm really, thank you for even having me. I'm, I'm really honored to be here. Um, and, and this is like kind of the most fun talk I could ever give. They, they, they asked me to do this thing where they're like, hey, why don't you come in and talk about some times, you know, maybe a couple of stories about times when you, you just did some really like badass work during your career. And I'm like, well, twist my arm. OK. And so, OK, great. And I'm like, oh, this sounds fun and it's going to be great. And then I'm like, what does badass even mean? I, I like what, what what are we even talking about? And, and so, like, I started thinking about, okay, well, what was, like, really, you know, what was it? Was that badass or was it, you know, like, what? And so I kind of I kind of got it in my head that, like, what really makes it badass is kind of like, you know, when you're playing pool and you call your shot, you know, like, eight ball in the corner pocket, you know? Like, it isn't badass if it just sort of happens and it's just happenstance. I mean, that's, you know, well, that's a fluke. It's fun. I'll take it. Um, but like if you it's when you really you know like you know what's gonna happen and you and you just kind of and you like make it happen you know by understanding and force of will and just and and some hard work and and so like well what and what does that mean and how can you learn to kind of call your shots and you know and how can you maybe do that more often and that's sort of what we're here to talk about today okay great so um, now, a lot of times people think about performance work and they're like, oh, I got to do all this regression management and stuff is breaking all the time and I got to fix this and fix that and fix the other thing and we have to measure all these times and we have to do latencies and I have to call like a 8 million user metrics and okay, so yeah, there's a good chunk of, of work in perf that's regression prevention and that stuff is super, super important, super important, super hard, but like to really get a sense of what's going on and to do the badass stuff, you have to understand what's actually happening. And, and this is where I start coming back to the, the my, what I mean mantras, which is that if what you're doing is measuring time, you're never really going to get anywhere. It's hard to understand what's going on with time. Like I like to say time is a metric I can only cry about, you know, I mean, it's slower. Oh, boohoo. Like I don't, what happened, you know? And so if you're working on say regression prevention or regression analysis, like your, your kind of job is just sort of, okay, well, tell, can you tell people what's going on? Like not that it's slower. Okay. Or, or, you know, bigger or whatever, but like, but why, what happened? And, and that's where I always say, hey, you know, you should really come back to those consumption metrics because time is not the cause of anything. Time is the effect of, you know, something going bad, right? And, and so then it's, it's that that's going to tell you what's going on. And, and so if you understand the causes of bad perf in your system, then you can do stuff to kind of forecast them, maybe control them, budget them, and you can decide, you know, what kinds of things should I be looking at so that when the time does go south, I know what to do, where to look, and how to get to something that I could actually act on. Okay, so now here comes the badass part. So we'll start by talking about the Midori project from uh, Microsoft. And it's, it's it, I called it the legendary Midori project because it's mentioned so often. And for being a project that was basically canceled and went nowhere, um, it actually, you know, bore a lot of fruit. Um, many people learned a lot of things and lots of interesting ideas happened there. Midori is a managed operating system, meaning it's written in a managed language, you know, like say Java or C Sharp. But actually the language that Midori was written in um, bore a much stronger resemblance to say hack than it did to anything else. It's full of continuations. It has no blocking primitives, you know, so everything is like async, 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 async. And um, that's fabulous for doing all kinds of perf work and many kinds of problems that you would normally face are just right off the table um, because everything in sight is asynchronous, right? So you can't do goofy stuff like block the UI thread because you can't block. Okay, so... Um, the OS, you know, if you want to know more about it, you could actually research, uh, say, Taos, um, and don't look at Windows because it's architected nothing like that. Um, and so I, well, I was talking about 
Midori with a friend of mine one day over lunch and 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 I said look okay you're doing this thing and like it's got all these wacky wacky you know non-blocking primitives and and at the time I thought no one could ever program the thing okay which turned out to be totally false because uh, you know non-blocking primitives became like the way to do stuff um, you know even just a few months after I said that but okay how do you write a browser in such a thing and I'm like okay, you can't write a browser it's not an operating system and so they they actually you know, said, yeah, we should do that. Let's let's build a browser. And okay, maybe it doesn't have to be the best browser or a fully complete browser, but like enough to kind of prove that you could really do flagship UI at least. And so they started to write one. And, and as it happens, two years later, I ended up joining Midori and I, and I helped work on it. Now, this particular browser was built using sort of reactive UI theory. Um, and this particular implementation of it was, well, it was a hog. And uh, at first, I just kind of tried to understand it. And and I wanted to get to the crux of like, okay, well, what is it that's making it a hog? Why is it problematic? And so let, let's, let me dig in. First, the idea that like having an agenda and moving from state to state according to sort of the theory of, of you know, reactive UIs is a bad idea. Well, that, that's false. Um, but the execution was a mess, okay? The way the thing was built um, all the behaviors were simple, simple objects and everything linked to all kinds of other stuff. Um, and so there was a crazy amount of storage uh, necessary to represent basic primitives, you know, like just like single CSS properties and tons and tons of dependencies. And I was trying to critique it and I said, guys, look, this thing is basically a compiler, okay? It reads text and emits a display list, okay? Like, how is this not a compiler? And it, it, the way it does it is by manipulating and adoring trees. And the data structures we have chosen basically are horrible for doing that operation. So can we kind of find a way, you know, to, to get there? So let me give you a sense of what this thing looked like, okay? So there's two main structures in a browser. There's actually more than two, of course, but here's two of the most important ones to kind of illustrate. There's what you would call the DOM tree and there's what you would call the box tree, okay? And the box tree is synthesized from the DOM and it includes like extra stuff, like let's say you have missing table rows, okay? If you have missing table row uh, directives, they have to be inserted into the box tree and they could potentially be styled even though they weren't even there. Um, and so there's maybe synthetic nodes, but there's a pretty strong correspondence between the DOM tree and the box tree. And of course, there's lots of dependencies node to node. Now, if you look at the way the DOM was implemented, it's just a bunch of pointers for the nodes and in, in, there's arbitrary number of um, children on each one. So each node points to like an array of children and the array of children points to the nodes and then the nodes point all back to the parent and oh boy. Okay, and now the way I typically evaluate data structures for goodness is I like, Pretend you're gonna smack yourself on your own wrist every time you drew an arrow. Now, when I think about doing that and think about this picture, I just I just cringe, okay? Because it's so many arrows, nothing is local. And the garbage collection cost for this would be staggering, okay? And per object overhead, every, it's just, it's just it's just a mess. But there's no law that says you have to do it this way. So if you think, okay, how do I do trees economically and represent these dependencies in a very economical way. So we came up with a different representation. It's very well known. This is sort of the tree in an array representation where um, the, uh, any one tree is one array. And um, so any given node is represented by its index and you can go from the index to the first child of that um, node or the next sibling of that node and that lets you sort of march forward or you can go back up to the parent. And so you end up with some ints okay, in an array, plus whatever you want your payload to be, okay, so in this, you know, this is, would be sort of our tree of sub t, okay, and we actually had generics, we, we were doing this in a C-sharp variant. Now, if you look at this picture, okay, both the DOM tree and the box tree are just arrays, okay, so there's not like one object per node, there's basically one object for each tree, so that's like two, okay. The indices, rather than being 64-bit pointers, they're like 16-bit integers, and we could get away with this because, well, for two reasons. You could browse the web all day long and not encounter a web page that has more than 64K nodes. But if you did, it's okay because, because they're arrays and they have to grow, we would just change the internal representation of the objects if, should it ever grow to beyond uh, 64K such that all the indices were now 32 bits. So when you, you know, when you grow to 64K, you also double the size of the integers. So no one needs to know that internally we're storing 16 bits. But 
because we're doing this, we can store all those pointers, okay, the first child, the parent, and the next sibling in the same space, in less space, than it would have taken to store a single 64-bit pointer, okay? So it's dense, dense, dense. And furthermore, you tend to write the stuff in DOM order when you read it. So when you insert the nodes, they tended to want to go to the to the bottom, and so children tended to arrive mostly in order, and okay, maybe there was some interleaving, but locality tended to be really quite high. And likewise, the, the box tree has, has a very strong dependence, and it, it has its shape. Now, the really beautiful part is that when, whenever you wanted to adorn one of these trees with some sort of annotation, you know, some computation that you did, like a style or something, you didn't encode the, si the shape of the tree at all. You know, for instance, if you were going to adorn the box tree with styles, you would have a parallel array that represented the style information that you wanted. And so the shape you get by following the pointers, uh, the, I say pointers, but I mean integers, the integers in the box tree, so you can walk around the box tree. But the actual annotation had just an array of whatever it was that you needed, like, say, colors, okay? And so the beauty of this is that, you know, there's no wasted space there at all. It's just data, 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 data. And all of the uh, dependencies between the various different ones are sort of implicit because you just sort of know that, oh, well, to compute the color depends on, you know, my uh, antecedent box. And I don't have to write that down, you know. So if I'm color number five, of course, I depend on box number five. And maybe I also depend on his parents, okay. But I know all this implicitly, so you don't need any pointers for those. So the dependencies are destroyed in favor of kind of meta rules for like this tree depends on that tree in this way and we had various trees for doing that stuff and yeah um pointers are replaced with small integers so you know how does this look well it turns out it looks really really good so i have this meeting with my boss okay and i tell him yeah so so uh so we did the math and uh, we're gonna the we're gonna reduce the memory by 95 percent in the next version and he's like well, what are you nuts? I mean, okay, you know, stop being stupid, Rico. You know, like this is, you know, this hyperbole isn't, you know, isn't impressing me. And I'm like, no, dude, you don't understand. Okay, I'm sandbagging at 95%. The math says it's going to be more like 98%. You know, and at that point, like, I get out a piece of paper and I'm like, let me show you. And so, why can I do this? Because you can do the math of it. You could be like, look, I have, you know, here's the benchmark cases. They have this many boxes. They have this many DOM nodes. We're going to have 5,000 of them. It's, you know, 18 bytes for each one of these and 24 bytes for each one of those. Do the math, do the math. And we all, we had a very good idea what the cost was on the old system. So I've got numerator and denominator, baby. Okay. And I'm like, this is what it's going to be. You know, I mean, you know, read my lips. And, um, it's very powerful, okay? And so then when you're able to deliver on that, you know, that's kind of like, wow. I mean, you know, I said it was going to be 95% better and boom, there it is. Okay, was it fast? Hell yeah, it was fast. Uh, reads tended to be in order. Uh, the data is super, super dense. Um, hardly ever actually expanded to 32-bit nodes and never, never expanded to 64-bit integers. Garbage collector times, you couldn't even measure them, okay? I mean, they were, they were so low that, you know, we couldn't get an accurate read on them, way less than 1%. And we had, you know, about 20 objects total for any web page. No matter how many nodes there are, you have the same number of arrays, and, you know, all the linkage between all the objects is completely declarative. Okay, so, and all of this on Reactive UI. It has an agenda, it has clean recalc, it has all the good properties of Reactive UI, those uh, tree be trees are tree behaviors and they do, you know, the usual kinds of reactive theory notifications and stuff. It was super elegant. And as a consequence, you know, when it came time to do stuff like compute the dirty region as a consequence of this node changing, man, you know, that was a few hours work for me. And it was just boom, right, right off the bat, because you get all that beautiful stuff from reactive UI theory. And the perf was fabulous. Why? Because we understood the costs. We knew where they were coming from. All right, here's another interesting example, the Surface RT, a great little device, and I wish people had loved it more because it was, uh, it was su super fun, maybe sort of ahead of its time. In fact, if it had been a generation later uh, on, on the ARM chips, I think it would have been a lot more successful. I mean, you, you know, nowadays you, you, can, you can find lovely ARM-based uh, tablets, and it's totally a thing. But okay, interesting specs, great lessons in those specs. Let's dig into some of those specs, okay? So... Uh, 
It has four cores at 1.3 gigahertz, Tegra 3 cores. They're lovely cores, you know, it's an ARM core. Two gig of main memory, 32 gig of storage. The display is not huge, but not tiny at 1366 by 768. And the memory bandwidth, and this is an important statistic, is 1200 megabytes per second, which you could measure. And in fact, later uh, devices would be bigger on, on that particular metric. And you'll see why that matters so much in just a second. Let's do a little math. At 1366 by 768, that's almost exactly 1 million pixels. And at four bytes a pop uh, for each pixel, it's actually 4,196,352 4, bytes, which is 4 meg plus 2K, which is weird. I don't know how we decided 4 meg plus 2K, but okay, there you go. At 60 FPS, and I'm just multiplying by 60 now, that's 240 megabytes per second. The total memory bandwidth is only 1200 meg. And this is system on a, you know, it's a, it's a system on a chip. So everything shares that memory bandwidth. So that means if you do two and a half pixel blends per frame at 60 FPS, you're done. Okay. Forget about the cores, forget about the GPU, just forget about it. You have no memory bandwidth left to do anything. Even if you have plenty of CPU cycles available, the CPU can't do anything because it can't get at memory. The moment it has to hit memory, it's gonna be stuck and all your blending is just gonna suck everything away. And so, wow, that completely changes the way you have to think about this thing. So what does it take to be great? Well, forget about the cores, okay? Composition is everything, all right? So you have to make sure every pixel is drawn well. The fewest number of pixel draws possible, and you don't want to draw a pixel more than once, okay? That's overdraw in any given frame. You don't want to, you know, recompute any given pixels. Your process cycles are likely to be abundant. So you should be looking at pixels all the way up and down the stack. And so even simple things, like if you want to play a movie in the background, that could drastically interfere with the overall processor's performance because the processor cache will be competing with composition. Yikes. Okay, so how do you do analysis? You start looking at screenshots of, you know, kind of which areas are hot, where is the pixel being drawn, and like, you know, how how deep is the layering at that, at that area. And so you start looking very closely at those draw operations. All right, so what do we have in common here? Well, the important thing is to have a clear understanding of the critical resource, okay? And we call it the critical resource because because it's a critical. <laughs> I mean, it also means, you know, the one that you're going to be most gated on. But like, even if you just think about it in terms of importance, we, we don't call it the don't even worry about it, it doesn't matter resource. It's the critical resource. So we need to know which one it is, and we need to understand its properties. And if you understand those things, you can give really cool rules to developers like, hey, two and a half blends, and you're done, okay? So, and they're like, wow, two and a half blends. Okay, I can get my head around that. So, and I gotta say, and two and a half blends, by the way, and not only are you done, but like everyone is done on that whole device. So, you know, you gotta use maybe not less, <laughs> quite a bit less than two and a half blends, right? And you can use it to make useful forecasts and you can explain regressions. You can say, hey, this scenario is now overdrawing, right? Meaning pixels are being touched more than once. So, and the, that overdraw is resulting in a 1.2 millisecond regression. So all, what you have to do is not draw those pixels two times or three times. Okay, now the forecasts, again, super, super important, okay? If you understand the truth of what's going on here and you're not fooled by all this other stuff, then you can do really cool stuff at the whiteboard because you can be like, oh, okay, I get it. Like I gotta do this app and okay, it's gonna be using maybe about the quarter of the screen and I only got, you know, two and a half blends total for a full screen. So, you know, and I can get away with maybe 30 FPS less or rather than 60. So like, okay, two and a half times two and two and a half times like another two, you know, so, okay. So I can afford 10 pixel blends if I'm doing my UI and this corner and I'll still stay, you know, at my 60 FPS. So that tells you, you know, can I do this animation I want to do in this corner? And you look like a god when you're up there just telling people, yeah, okay, you can do it about this big and this size, you know, with this many blends and you're good to go any more than that and the device is dead. And they're like, how do you know this? And I'm like, well, do the math. It's 1200, you know, here's the thing. And so putting these tools in people's hands so that they kind of understand it, super, super valuable much more valuable than like, hey, you know, like you have a seven millisecond glitch. Like, okay, I mean, so where's the seven milliseconds coming from? I don't, you know, I, time is so, so hard to work with. But 
Again, you do need to go back to those user focus metrics after you do this analysis, you know, and you've got the blends and you've got the pixel counts, right? You can be like, okay, is this adding up? Do I have, you know, am I, am I, am I reducing my glitches? Is it looking clean? You know, how much overhead do I le have left on overall memory? You can maybe plot that and, you know, plot your FPS and see how that's going. And then you'll, you'll have kind of the theory of what matters versus, you know, the, the visibility of what matters to the user. And you can kind of get those things working harmoniously. And if they're not working, harmoniously, it means you're missing something, right? There's some important consumption, you know, that you don't quite understand, right? Maybe it's something about the disk, maybe it's network, maybe it's, you know, CPU, um, maybe it's memory, you know, maybe it's the GPU. Um, and I mean, but it's one of those things, you know, one of those things is kind of driving the overall cost because that's all there is on that device. Any kind of slowness in basically stems from either one of those things or else bad orchestration where you've got your system so entangled with itself that it's just blocked doing nothing, you know? Um, so yeah, you don't want to be thinking about data you can only cry about time to make plans or report problems. You need to get to the causes. That's the source of your truth. All right. Thank you very much for having me today. It's been a pleasure talking to you and I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Uh, I think we have some time for questions. Indeed, we do have some time so, for questions. So please, if you haven't asked your questions yet in the Q&A section or in the Slack, please do so right now. We have a few minutes for questions. I have Slack on the screen, so when I turn my head, it means I'm, I'm slacking. <laughs> the Slack position, non-Slack non position. Slack, non-slack. I think everyone was so impressed by your presentation that they just they just don't even know what to ask. Uh, by the way, amazing talk. Thank you so much, Rico, for, for the amazing talk and your uh, stories. It's always fascinating to hear them. And uh, uh, I'm just... Uh, looking forward for the next event so as we can hear more of them. I'm sure you have a lot of other awesome stories. Well, it's always fun to talk. Um, you know, in some sense, the, uh, you know, our, our culture, uh, the, the culture of, you know, the people who do this is, is built around successes that we had and, you know, and sharing what works with people. I mean, and lots of us, I think the reason these stories resonate is that lots of us have experienced similar situations. And so it's, I don't know, it can be helpful to boil this stuff down to just a few things. Um, I've been on this sort of jihad to get people to think about consumption metrics for like 10 years. You know, it's just think about consumption a lot more than you think about time. Um, and then keep going back to like, do I have it right? That's the most important part. If you understand the consumption and you, then your forecasts are working, then it should be getting back to the users and the user metrics. Because, you know, my mom never calls and says, hey, I want you to have your page faults when my app starts. I mean, this is not how she thinks about it, right? So it's important to keep coming back to what users want. But those things rarely help you to make good decisions. You kind of have to be, okay, well, like, where's this time coming from? But if you aren't also checking, like, am I really moving the time the way it's supposed to? Do I really understand it? Do I have the cost? If you have the wrong cost, then you're just going to do dumb stuff. And then your charts are going to look great and your users are still going to hate the problem, uh, still going to, you know, hate it. Yeah, I think it's actually, it's similar to domain-driven design. When you build this ubiquitous language where you can communicate uh, to developers the uh, the performance in terms of user perception. First of all, it's much easier for a user to report issues because like you just have the same notion of what a problem is, but also it's much easier for developer to understand what kind of implications, real world implications it has instead of just vague abstract numbers that tell nothing about what is actually happening. And I believe that, um, uh, Microsoft Bing had a lot of success communicating higher level domain concepts to developers. 
and they are pushing much harder uh, for you know using this ubiquitous language instead of abstract terms. So I think it's definitely something that everyone should at least consider or try. And not to mention that consumption metrics are also usually um, uh, somewhat easier to measure, like they are a little bit more stable. Cool. So yeah. a lot of efforts are actually um, yeah. we are trying are in in the area of just exploring whether we can use more consumption metrics and and just forget a little bit about the uh, CPU. Uh, just because it's just well, super tricky. CPU cycles is not so bad, or instructions retired is not so bad. It's the time, the times are the ones that are the, the most unstable. So like, if you're looking at disk I.O., total bytes read is great. I mean, if I read a million bytes on my device, probably you read a million bytes on your device too. And so if you have a sense of, you know, on our customers' machines, we can afford 10 meg of data reads during startup. Just totally made that up then you can measure that 10 meg on any device and you don't have to have a special build and you don't have to have a special lab. You can just, you know, you can like, look, did I read 10 meg or didn't I? Um, and you can see if you're, if it's files, you know, you can see, well, what files am I reading? Where's it coming? And um, that also helps with regressions, right? Because now you can be like, okay, what's driving the consumption? And, and it's just, it's so much easier to do this. Um, if you're thinking about the resource, generally you can, you know, you can break it down to like what operations are burning it, what and what's the usage. If it's a GPU, you can be like, is it copies? Is it CUDA? Is it 3D primitives? Is it, you know, what's going on? Um, and that gives you a sense of okay, what's happening on that GPU and what's driving the cost and how do I break it down and who drives that work? And this all turns into opportunities for engineers to kind of like really dig in. And, and make progress. Um, so yeah, and then just generally a lot simpler. Then what makes you a badass is your ability to forecast. Because when you're looking at that stuff and you'd be like, you know what, we're, we're blowing 50% of our reads on this goofy thing, we could cut that right out. That can turn into a very strong prediction for what will happen when you make the appropriate changes which then makes it a lot easier for you to get support from your organization and to just be successful. And it just builds confidence, right? You know, so if you're confident that you're going to get the outcome you want because you've done the math and you can see where the consumption is coming from, it's great. Counts are also great. Um, sometimes straight up counts like how many paints did I do? You know, how many styles did I recompute? And those are lovely because like it doesn't matter how long it took. It doesn't matter what device you did it on. Like, if you recomputed 10,000 styles and you're like, yeah, I recomputed 10,000 styles, but only seven of them were different. Like, what's going on there? Why, you know, I'm, I have wasted recomputation. Highlights an opportunity. And if there's a regression, you can be like, hey, you know, we're painting and painting is taking longer. Paint code didn't change. A lot of times, the problem is completely elsewhere. So, you know, maybe you have to look upstream and be like, well, what did we do with the styles? Oh, we just dirtied a bunch of, you know, we dirtied a bunch of boxes. And the interesting thing is, like, the place where the bug is might be very inexpensive from a time perspective, right? So it would never show up on a profile. You'd be like, you know, the regression's in painting. Well, <laughs> I mean, I guess, but the paint code just got victimized by, like, maybe some up-level thing, you know, that caused a whole giant rectangle to get dirty for no good reason. And so you need to get to the crux of, like, what did we draw? Why did we draw it? What drove that? You know, and it's those chains that are super valuable. and None of this has anything to do with time. So, and that's often the case. You know, once you understand the system, like time becomes less and less interesting, and these essential metrics for what's happening become driving thing. I'm just looking to see if questions are popping up. But... I I have a question. I can't type. This is Reham, by the way. Um, I have a question. I can't type it, but I want to ask you: Were there times where your predictions, like just when uh, you implemented the thing, were not? what you expected them to be, like either way better or way worse. And what, what do you do in this case? Okay, well, so my, my favorite saying is, if you're really good at performance, you're only wrong 95% of the time. If you're not good, it's worse. That is so accurate. Yeah, yeah so no, so it's, so no, you, you plan on being wrong. The, the trick is that, um, you know, I'm wrong like 19 times out of 20. The trick is to be wrong quickly. <laughs> 
So like you make forecasts, look at what your model is and you see, oh, that's not working. Oh, that's not right at all. And then you make adjustments. And so you like, and then by the time you write a report on what happened, like you generally don't talk about the 95% that didn't work. You talk about the 5% that did. Um, it's kind of like good photography. You can take lots of pictures. You don't show anyone the bad ones. Um, so you should plan on iterating on these things, you know, and it generally takes many iterations to really get to the truth of which pieces of consumption matter and how, you know, you can explain it to people in a fairly straightforward way. When you've done that, you can say really cool stuff. Like if you keep your blends below two and a half, you're in good shape. And that's like one number, you know, that's readily measurable, right? Like how many blends are we doing? You know, like, oh, we're at 1.7. Okay. Well, that's pretty good. Right. So when you can distill things down to a small number of sort of metrics that people can look at that are really strong forecasters, that's fabulous. But as a professional, you absolutely should expect to be wrong lots of times during that journey. So which doesn't mean you shouldn't try, you know, but that's that's sort of the gold standard. Go look, try to understand the consumptions, try to make a model for what's going on, see how that's working. Turn the crank on that a few times, maybe 20 times until you get something that's actually pretty good at forecasting and then run with it. But that's great. Thank you so much. And yes, yeah. I totally agree with you about being wrong fast because I will tell people like one of the hardest things about being a performance engineer is you will have confirmation biases. Like a lot of times yeah. you will see the things working the way you want them to see and just just admitting that no, this is really not working is, is sometimes very challenging. So you have to be very conscious about it to be able to do that. Absolutely. And if, if you go into it with the expectation that I'm probably wrong, um, many healthy things, I mean, that's a whole talk on its own, but good, healthy things happen by beginning with, I probably don't understand this. There's probably more going on here. I should yeah. do experiments and confirm and just, you know, and do stupid experiments. That's the best part. Like you have theories like delete the code that you think is, work is, is slow, right? Like, and mm -hmm. delete it. And okay, well, the program probably won't work, but it should be like a lot faster. Or, or another thing you can do is like run it twice. Just, yep. you know, and you, so you should see a big regression with the stuff. And if, if it doesn't, if these stupid little experiments don't tend to, you know, reaffirm that what's going on is what you thought was going on, then yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good sign that you're missing something important. Yeah, but that's, that's true. Really I, I try to always like uh, come up with a theory and then even before verifying it, assume like, now let's assume that I'm wrong. This is not it. What else could it be? And Good. somehow this always like helps. But thank you so much. I see some questions popping up as well. Good. It's it's super healthy to be skeptical, self skeptical. Yeah. Super healthy. Um, thank you. I'm, are are so you seeing have... questions, Stars? I'm not seeing anything. Maybe I'm looking in the wrong place. I can. Yeah. We it looks like we have uh, time for only one question. Uh, that's. The reminder that you should ask questions as early as possible so that you can answer them. So the question is, how do you go about hypothesizing what the possible causes of perf issues can be? Okay, well, typically I, I start from the, the big five sources of consumption. Um, and so if it's not, you know, memory, disk, network, CPU, GPU, um, then the only thing that's really left is orchestration, right? And anytime you put a critical section around anything, you've just created a software resource. And the software resources, you can model them kind of the same way you would with a disk. It's got a average service time. It's got a queue length. Okay, so um, so if, you, if it's not immediately, you know, derivable by looking at kind of what's going on with the, with the big five essential resources, then it's something software and you should be looking at orchestration. And so then you start looking at critical sections and blocking and, you know, which stacks are you blocked on? Um, and from there, you can typically go to figure out which is the software resource that's important. And then you can start instrumenting those as if it was something physical and then kind of throw it into the mix again. And uh, that's pretty helpful. But, you know, it's pretty much got to be one of the essential five resources or else it's orchestration. And, you know, that's that's generally how I do it. And I guess we have time for one more question. So it's awesome to see performance analysis at various levels of the stack, browser devices. What kinds of performance problems are you working on in current role? Any lessons, tips you've learned from this? Um, uh, right now I'm working on Messenger. 
Um, and I tend to work on pretty low levels in the stack. And so I think for me, the, the big lesson there, and it's very similar to in many other places, is like size drives a lot of uh, of problems in perf. Like if you if you go looking for like what went wrong, a lot of times the answer is it just got too big. It's out of control. The representations are too loose. They're not local. They're not dense. Um, so you know, many times my advice boils down to like get the pointers out of your data structures, store data, 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 dense, dense, dense. And so by making the code smaller and having, you know, good sharing of code and running the same code, making the data smaller, keeping the data local, you tend to do really well. And almost everything that's happened in the last two years, I mean, we had tremendous results in Messenger Lightspeed. Um, you can read all about it at some length, but you know, it's, it's the startup time is like a quarter what it was on the classic. And almost all of that comes from density, locality, you know, small binary, small data, don't over cache, you know, don't have crazy levels of indirection, too many levels of abstraction inevitably lead to like non-locality and they're just bad for the processor. And so those are kind of the, the big things. Think smaller, simpler, you know, in two words. Awesome. I, thank you. We're, we're done, yes? Uh, yeah, thank you so much, Rico. It was oh, my pleasure. pleasure. And thank you so much for answering the questions.